Everybody all right? Everybody all right? That's better. Who wants to do this for me? I'm tired. We're going to talk about American history for a little while. Everybody good on their American history? All right, there's a big no. All right, fair enough. Technology. We have technology everywhere. That's my office at home. And the new cell phone receivers that we have to use while driving in the United States. We're going to talk about warfare. A little history here. Warfare used to take a long, long time. So back then, they sat there on the plains of Troy for nine years before they got their Trojan horse to work. Kind of sounds like Stuxnet, doesn't it? Took a long time, an APT. Then it became months. Let's everybody get together, we're going to have a war, and then they plan it all out, and then they fight. Sometimes, even in the Civil War in the United States, they would have parties with the slaves on the top of the hills, waiting for the war to begin so that the ladies in their dresses could enjoy the battle below. Then things got faster and faster. Let's make it a little bit more efficient. And we did the same thing in, back in 1990. We prepared. We told them, we're coming. We're coming. And we spent six months preparing, and then six weeks, as we said, with awe to soften the enemy. Six weeks. Then we, the war was over in 100 hours. So things are speeding up a great deal. But now today, we're looking at warfare and conflict by the microsecond, where the human element is no longer really possible to be involved in some of the things we've been talking about yesterday. How fast can we defend? I know Jason was talking about this. We have to have high-speed remediation, high-speed fixing. And we're looking at all of our networks, and yet we have very difficult time measuring our networks. Does anybody here really know where everything is in their network? Anybody? That's a pretty sad state of affairs when you don't even know what you're defending, which makes it more and more difficult. Infrastructure warfare. There was a report that came out just last night that said Chinese telecommunications admitted that they now have inside access to every U.S. telecommunications service. Infrastructural warfare that is ex happening exceedingly quickly. Now, I'm old and gray, so security used to be easy. We had a dumb terminal. We talked a little about this yesterday. A dumb terminal asking a machine over there, let's do something. So security, the control mechanism, was very one-directional, very simple. But the world is evolving very, very quickly. And this bi-directional mechanism of security where any piece of information, any piece of access can work in two directions makes things exceedingly complicated. So when we look at network defense or network attack, and we'll be doing some more network attack things after work, uh, after lunch, we looked at there are several elements, and this was developed by the U.S. Air Force back in the 1980s. And it's called the OODA loop, and it applies specifically to network defense as well as network attack. It was designed for warfare, and it's called OODA. Observe, look around, let's get it, figure out what's going on, orient, put it into context. What does that mean? What does what I observe actually mean in a meaningful way? We talked about that yesterday, that raw information is useless until it is framed in something. Then you make a decision based upon my observation, based upon my orientation and contextualization. I make a decision, and then I act. And then I observe again the results of my action. And it goes over and over and over. From a warfare standpoint, we apply this very easily to both computer network defense, excuse me, and computer network attack. So with this symmetry going back and forth, 
there is virtually no way today for us to really model exactly what our networks are doing unless we, and we talked about this, simplify things a great deal. But simplification means your management, your C-level executives will not be happy. Your users will not be happy. But the first rule of all good security is what? Anybody know the first rule of security? Kill all the users. Then we're in good shape. So security and computers began back in the 1970s. And we developed some models, some ideas. The Pentagon, Department of Defense, spent a lot of money to figure it out. And what they did was came up with the idea that we used in the Cold War. Let's build the walls around the computers really, really high so nobody can get in. That makes sense? That's a good model, isn't it? You can always fly over it which is exactly the point. Fortress mentality worked in the old days with the dumb terminal and the mainframe. Right, Hans? That was why you challenged me yesterday on that. Risk avoidance. And what we used back in those days was guards and fences and dogs, but we had no networks. So, back in Troy, the way that they lost... They had the walls, but then they lower the gate, in comes the Trojan, and this is why we call it that today, because the metaphor is absolutely perfect. Now, China tried it as well, the Great Wall of China. Was that a military success? Anybody? Was that a military success? And how'd they get around it? How'd they get around? Anybody know? They bribed the guards. They gave them gold, and they just bypassed the wall entirely or got, here, here's a ladder, give me some gold, here's a ladder, come on over. Did not work. So defeating fortress mentality, we saw then again come up in the Middle Ages with da Vinci and the catapult, avoid the walls, and we, the siege warfare became how do I defeat the wall. Some people try to beat on the wall very, very hard, some people try to go over the wall, or in Great Wall of China, they were using social engineering, as we talked about yesterday with Chris. Maginot Line, after World War I, said, never again will the Germans come in to France. That was a military success, correct? <laughs> what did they do? They said, oh, Belgium's over there. Let's go take care of Belgium first, and then we'll come on down to Paris doesn't work. So early security models that we developed through the Department of Defense took this approach. Keep everybody out. Now how would that work in today's world? Keeping everybody out of your networks. Is that really your goal? Do we want to keep people out of our networks? That's not such an easy question anymore, is it? because we want to be able to do business. And doing business means that they have to get into some of our networks, but not all of the portions of our networks. If we can put a wall, is that going to work? And we're seeing that this does not really work. So we have to look at some other approaches. Now, the way that it was decided to do this back in the 1970s was called the reference monitor. And it was a simple, and I think it was a great model. There's a system request, stop processing, go over, look up the ACTs, the access rules of the system, make a decision, and then either you go or no go. So this is a small version of the OODA loop in the reference monitor that the military developed in the 1970s to apply to computers. This worked for one-way security in a simple system from dumb terminal to mainframe. Now, what happens if I take this model and put it into a network? What happens to my network? Anybody? What happens to my network? Sorry? 
it will not run anymore because it will absolutely slow everything down because we're not using single requests anymore. For every single request that we think of as an operational object, there's hundreds of small little objects and processes and decisions that need to be made. And the amount of horsepower, CPU processing power required to make this work would make the networks almost non-usable. So throughout the last 30 years, we have all of these various flavors of this. Uh, in uh, 1987, TSEC, US government, military, NSA said, we better go look at how to secure a network. And they came out with what we called the Red Book. And it was about this thick. Did anybody here read the Red Book? Anybody old enough to remember? Do they teach it anymore? Oh, we got somebody back there going, hey, I read it. And at the end of all 400 pages of the Red Book, the government's best minds, they said, well, basically, we don't know how to secure a network. And that was where we were left in 1980. So there's been a couple of other attempts, and now we've got uh, various flavors of a little certification here and there. But that certification is almost meaningless because the minute you change one bit of code, that certification is now gone. So what we really learned is we are not smart enough to build a secure computer. We don't know how to do it if we expect it to do anything. So how do we look at security from perhaps a different approach? And what we're going to do is, what are our goals? Ideally, we want simplicity. I know I do. I always talk, let's make things simpler and simpler. Take away some of what the uh, users really do not need. Now, we also want to have as much utility as we possibly can. And I'd like to be able to measure some of my security, really understand what is going on. So we have some goals. And by the way, if anybody wants this presentation afterwards, email me. I'll be happy to send it to you. It's only 200 megabytes, so please, no problem. So we're going to look at American history, to, to, how, to, how to solve this. Jesse James was a great train robber. Why did he rob trains? What did he want? What? Money. Whoop! He wanted the money. He wanted that safe. So Jesse James steals the safe. The train goes away. Inside that safe, there's gold and there's cash and there's diamonds, whatever. Are the contents of that safe secure? Are the contents of that safe secure? Anybody? What? No, with dynamite. Okay, huge amount of force. What's the other reason it may not be secure? Jesse James has a lot of time. Train's gone. He's got it. He could use dynamite. Maybe he could drill it. Maybe a hammer on the locks. He has a lot of time to play around with the safe. And today, the, mod, the equivalent model would be an APT. Plenty of time to do it. So who's the safe and the content secure from? The good guys, not from the bad guys. So let's fast forward to today and take a similar model. This vault is in a bank outside of New York. That metal is made from the alien metal that the U.S. has at Area 51. It's impenetrable metal. It's six foot thick all the way around. And inside of it is millions and millions of dollars. When that vault door is closed, are the contents of that safe secure? Why? Sorry? Have to get the code. And where do you get the code? From the guy, whoever, the, the bank manager, somewhere, somebody's got a code. So what are you going to do? You're going to use some social engineering. I don't know if Chris is still here. 
Uh, you're going to torture the guy. What are you going to do? You go not directly at the fortress walls. You go around them by using other techniques. Again, it's a matter of time. So there's ratings. We can actually measure the security of safes these days. In the U.S., we're allowed to have up to 500 guns per person per month. So we have gun safes, millions of gun safes, and they are rated. They are rated for how much temperature it takes to burn through the walls over what period of time. We know exactly how secure the safe is in a measurement of time. So what do we've got? We have the issue of protection. In the physical world, we understand how secure a door is. How hard is it to break through that door? I could kick it through. No, I can't kick it through. Hans could, no, he can't kick it through either. Some of you guys could kick it through in a couple minutes. A big, thick door, maybe you need a battering ram that the police have. But we can measure. Why are my Skypes coming through? I should turn to my Skype off. But the second thing that we have in when we're protecting the physical world is detection. And we've got alarm systems. And we can measure alarm systems. We know how long it physically takes for an alarm to ring, for it to react to the bad guy breaking in the door, bad guy walking around, changing the heat of the room, maybe a motion sensor. We can measure exactly how long it takes to detect the bad guy trying to do a bad guy thing. And then, once we know that, the alarms go off and we call the guy, again, with a gun. Come on down and shoot the bad guys, please. This is how we protect things in the physical world. Each one of these elements we understand very, very well. So when you see a movie of the bad guys robbing a store, a jewelry store, one guy always has a clock, doesn't he? 90 seconds, 80 seconds, because they know exactly how long it's going to take for the cops to arrive because they assume that they have triggered the alarm. Even if they've disconnected the alarm, they assume that they've triggered it. So they know how much time they've got. So everything in the physical world is about time. So the object is, how can we use this kind of thinking and apply it to network security? Well, in the physical world, we know that the safe is good for a couple of hours, uh, depending upon the temperature, or until I get a hold of the bank manager and torture it out of him. We have some sort of idea. Now, in your networks, does anybody know exactly how long it takes for a bad guy to break into your network? Anybody? That is the sad state of what we have right now. We don't know. Is your firewall configured correctly? Are the passwords any good? Who is the idiot that's going to respond to the phishing attack? We don't know. So we need to assume that we do not understand the amount of time that P represents. Protection. We don't know. So can we rely upon protection mechanisms for our security? And I maintain no. That that alone by itself is insufficient. And that is what most of us are being budgeted with, add protection, add protection, yet none of us know how good it is. And that is a problem. That is a problem. So when protection is not absolute, what do we have to do? We install a firewall. 
So I was on, I wanted to get on this field. It's outside of York in England. I could not get through that gate, so I never could make it onto that field. And this is the state of what we're dealing with today. Now let's look at detection. How do we detect things in our networks? We have lots of different techniques. In the physical world, we've got alarms and things. And in the cyber world, we have various times of hopefully you've got some IDS, you have some IPS, and you're looking for, hopefully, profiling the network activity. How long does it take in your network to detect the network behavior doing something wrong? Anybody have any idea how long it takes in your network in time? Again, you should know this. You've invested in the technology. You got IPS, you got IDS, you have all of these anomaly detectors built in. You should know how long they take to work. Otherwise, why do you have them? Until you know how good they really are. So, now back into the next step, detection time. You can actually measure this in your existing networks using pen test methods. Create a network anomaly. Create the behavior that you're looking for when you're trying to detect bad guys. Simulate that and measure your own systems. It's not hard. You have all the tools to do it. Measure it. Is it one second, one millisecond? Is it a week? Do you get an SMS message? How long does it take? But the next step in this is the reaction. And that's what Jason was talking about yesterday. Once that detection of the network behavior, when something is wrong, you have to do something about it. I saw some reports from NASA, and there was stacks and stacks and stacks of syslog. And I said, how do you go through this? They said, oh, once a month. So their 30-day process of detection and reaction, 30 days, is that enough? Is that a good, that's good, isn't it? Anybody think 30 days is good? For the attacker, thank you. <laughs> exactly. And I'm going to show you the formula for that as well. There's math that actually shows this. These are the pieces that you can measure right now in your network. The detection time. Test your own stuff. Find out how fast it is. Then your reaction. What do you do? What happens once the network anomaly is detected? Do you send an SMS? Does it have an alert on the screen? Well, if it has an alert on the screen, that's good, except maybe the administrator is off at lunch for an hour. If it's in France, three hours. <laughs> Just saying. Or maybe it's the weekend. Or do you have a sign on your network, all attackers, please only attack from nine to five? Again, we have the opportunity to measure the amount of time. So if I can measure my detection mechanisms inside my networks, and I suggest that you challenge your vendors to provide you with the metrics, they design the damn things. How long does it take? Show me. Prove it to me then test it in your network to validate it. And then your remediation process, the reaction. How long does it take to create that reaction, to get somebody to solve the problem? So in the physical world, things can happen at various speeds. We can measure them. It's up to you now to measure them in your world. So we have a formula that comes out of this. And it fundamentally says, if the amount of protection that
that my network defenses have measured in time is greater than the amount of time it takes to detect and react to a bad guy doing a bad guy thing in my network, I have a secure environment. Think about it. It's not going to appear magically to you now, but think about it, and I'll give you all the slides. But this formula is the basis of where we, how you can begin to actually measure the effectiveness of all of the spending that you're doing in your networks and prove to your bosses it's good and maybe actually get some more money. Now, here's the problem. We do not know, we've all just said, we don't know how good our defenses are. We spend millions and millions and millions of euros on our defenses, yet not one of you can tell me how good they are. Because we don't have the technology to measure the effectiveness of protection in the cyber world like we do in the physical world. So what we do, we have to assume, I have no protection. Assume for a moment that all of that investment is zero when it comes to time. Therefore, we end up with a new value called E, exposure. If you measure your detection, you measure your reaction, you now know the maximum amount of exposure time that you have in your networks. Very, very simple concept you can actually measure the exposure that your networks have got. So one of the questions that comes up then is, how much damage can a bad guy do in your network in five minutes, 10 hours, 30 days? So it becomes very clear that I want my time my detection time and my reaction time to be what? What do I want them to be? Anybody, what do I want them to be? Sorry? Short. I want the high speed detection. I want high speed reaction. So we can actually look at these things because they're all measurable. Can't, I don't know on my protection, but my detection time. Detection should be really, really, really fast. These are wires we're dealing with, electronics. And if it's slow, go find a new vendor. Go get something else or reconfigure it or fire the administrator. Then you've got the notification process, which takes some amount of time. The transit process. If the administrator's at home, can he fix it from there? Maybe. Does he have to drive to work? Maybe. That needs to be calculated in as part of the remediation time to rectify the problem. And then is the rectification itself easy? Does it take, oh, two keystrokes? Or does it require hours of reconfiguration? That depends upon the nature of the type of anomaly an attack that is going on. But you can measure all of these things very, very easily with your current technologies and no new investment. Now that was with automatic, that was, this prior slide is here is with human interaction. But should we have human interaction on everything we do? And I'm suggesting no. Automate some of your reactions. Your networks should start being smart enough, and you have the technology right now to do some of these things. And some of the better firewalls allow. There's Rene. He's a friend of mine up at, you know Rene, don't you? It's like, Rene, he's on and off all the time. You should be able to automate this. And when you automate it, things speed up. So over here, in this example, we have an exposure time of 8.8 .8 minutes, based upon just some model I made up. And from a, only looking at it from confidentiality violation standpoint of stealing and downloading data, because we've heard yesterday some of these APTs that the guy sitting in the network for weeks or months at a time, he downloaded 1.7 terabytes. Well, that takes some time. Time. Funny, we come back to that word again. And time is a function of bandwidth.
and file size. And there's math, and I'll show you how this all works. You can figure out exactly what is going to be exposed. So I want to speed this process up, so maybe I should automate some of it. So if my detection is really, really fast, my notification and transit should be electronic speed again. And my rectification, there are certain things I can figure out well in advance. And I can remote automate into my access control tables. If this happens, cut this off. Real simple, very easy. If I see this, do this. If I see that, do that. And we call those reaction tables. Oh, wait. Uh, there's, a chart, there's a chart here somewhere on it. My reaction tables should give me an idea, and you set the rules. You set the rules. I don't set the rules, and every company's rules are going to be a little bit different. If you see something go wrong, have an automated process to respond as quickly as possible, because in this case, now my exposure time, because I've automated it, I've removed the human from the process, is down to less than one second. And in less than one second, he's not going to get your 200 million file names from, the, from Sony, are they? Because that takes a little bit longer. That takes weeks. So speeding the process up is absolutely critical. So protection, you can look at it this way. Why bother investing in new firewalls and new defensive technologies until you really understand what your detection technologies are capable of doing and your reaction processes and policies within your own company. Until you know those, spending more and more and more money on a new firewall or a new access control mechanism that you cannot measure, where's the value in it? So this is part of the math as well, and again, you can have copies of the slides as to which files become targets. And it's all a matter of the bandwidth of your network and the amount of access time you allow the bad guys to have to your networks before you actually do something about it. And again, don't worry about writing all the math down. You can have them all. So the bad guys often will say, well, I'm going to go cut the alarm. So in this case, we're attacking the detection mechanism. So many alarm systems, and we see this in movies with bomb makers. If you cut the wrong wire, the bomb goes off. What they have done is added a layer of protection to a detection mechanism. If you cut the alarm wire, the alarm will go off. So. One way of looking at your networks is to add an additional layer of detect, uh, protection to whatever your detection mechanism is. And you can do the same thing to your reaction channel. I want to cut off the phone that calls the police, would be the physical model in the case of a jewelry robbery, perhaps. In your world, how does remediation take place? What is the vulnerability in your remediation process? If you don't know this, you then you cannot plan for proper remediation. So how far do you want to carry this? You can go on and on and on. It can get crazy. But the model and the principle of using P is greater than D plus R will work no matter how far you want to go. Reaction channels. Every organization should have a method of reaction. Now, is it within one department? Maybe. Is it with throughout the entire company? Maybe. That's up to you. Uh, multiple reaction channels, depending upon the level of sensitivity of what you're trying to protect. That's fine, too. And then upgrading. Upgrade your detection sensitivity. I sense a potential attack over here. I better upgrade my detection over here. You have the technology to do this stuff right now if you look at the networks a little bit differently than you currently have, than you currently are. And you start throwing a little bit of math behind them. And here's a, a case of a reaction matrix of different types of attacks. And some of them we use. Three bad passwords, you're cut off. We do that now, and hopefully you do. 
And so there's various other types of attacks that you want to be able to detect and hopefully have an automatic reaction to. So, very simple model. We're talking about adding a feedback process to protection or detection or reaction where you determine how long something should take. This can be coded in six lines. How long should something take? If it takes longer, something is wrong, do something about it. Six lines of code to put this into place. It also works by looking at denial of service within your own networks to identify what is going wrong and reacting to it by using what we call OOB, out-of-band communication, because so much of DDoS today is merely overwhelming a primary communications channel. If you don't have an alternative out-of-band communication channel as part of remediation, you will continue to be victimized. Add that little bit of external, inexpensive these days, method of alternate band of communication. So defensive time-based security, simple process. It's looking at what you currently have, actually measuring what you currently have, getting your vendors involved with it, and then making some appropriate decisions. And you can actually throw numbers at it now. Here's my ROI. Here is my value loss potential based upon my current infrastructure, my current defensive posture. And again, you can have all of these because the same sets of numbers work for attack. And attackers can use the same methodology. And when they're looking at your networks, this is what they're looking at. So I'm going to move on to something very quickly about how to launch a nuke. Anybody know how to launch a nuke? Come on, you're French. Come on. <laughs> two man rule. Two men. You got to have two guys that have no, they don't care if they blow up 20 million people, and each one has a key separated by 20 feet, and if one guy doesn't turn the key, at least in the U.S. this is true, I gotta shoot him. So then somebody else comes down and then we can launch the keys. It's called the two-man rule. Now let's look at combining time-based security and the two-man rule. Right now, today, we have single administrative root control. One guy is responsible. One guy has the control. I think that's stupid. Because how much do you trust people? And we'll be talking more about that in the attack section later on today. So since one guy cannot work 24 hours a day, we must have multiple administrators over the same root mission critical systems. And this weakens security because I've got more people capable of either making a mistake or going malicious on me. So what do I do? We go to the two-man rule. Two-man rule says the first guy's got to, and actually that's a girl, believe it or not, the first person has to make the security change. Second person has to enforce it. The problem with this, however, is the amount of time that it takes to get the second person to agree. And we've all seen this with managers and executives where we work now. How long does it take people to get to agree? Ugh, nothing gets done. And we pull our hair out. So what do we do? <clears throat> we apply time-based security feedback mechanisms for the approval cycle. We change the fundamental way that we code in the root process for access control in mission-critical systems. So one guy makes a decision, part of the design says, we're going to give the second guy one hour, one day, you choose, to approve or disapprove of that system change. And it's a very simple process, simple Boolean logic. There's a lot of math behind here where you can actually examine the vulnerability to your networks based upon how much you trust these people, which I haven't had time to get into, there's math on that, how much you trust the second person, how long it takes them to react to it, and then plug that back into the time-based security formulas and come up with a hard number as to the actual 
security level of your network. And you can make it all sorts of cool Boolean stuff and change things. It's a simple and or with a time-based feedback mechanism, which is uh, age old, except we don't use it in security for reasons that uh, do, uh, escape me. Fundamental formulas to the whole thing. Very, very simple. And the attackers know these. They know these things. And how do we know? Because we go to the movies. They've been using them for decades. Yet this industry, we have forgotten about how simple some of these ideas really are. So we're not going to go to Wayne Gretzky. I know I'm out of time, and I know I covered a lot of material very quickly. I'm going to make these slides to anybody who wants them. I'd be happy to send them to you in PDF format, uh, but make sure you have a PDF malware detection mechanism on them because I will try to infect you. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions uh, after the session uh, outside and out and about. Thank you very much.